Big Bill Byron picks up the win at Circuit of the Americas. Kyle Busch absolutely scares Chris Revelle straight. And was this a good race? William Byron's win percentage in 2024 so far is 30%, which is absolutely incredible for him. He picked up his second race win of the season in the first six races, absolutely dominating the day at Circuit of the Americas. He led 42 of 68 laps, and if it wasn't for these arbitrary stage break cautions that we absolutely do not need, he probably would have led even more laps because that 24 car was hooked up like it was Jeff Gordon back in the 2000s at Sonoma. It was absolutely unstoppable. Chris Rebell did the best job that he could, and... That was only second best. This race though, while I'll probably give it like a 65 overall, it wasn't actually that bad. I think that the broadcast had a lot to do with that, but this race did have a little bit of everything that we could ask for. It had first lap drama with Corey LaJoy when he ran wide and then decided to just go all family guy and say, I turn left now, good luck everybody, and just smashed right into the 19 car of Martin Trex Jr. as well as the 23 of Bubba Wallace. And poor Martin just became the sandwich in this LaJoy Bubba Wallace um, bread right there and it just was bad from the beginning bubble walls rebounded for a 15th place finish Corey lajoy collapsed when he got out of his car post race because his body cramped up thankfully he's fine but that was a really stupid move because if you're going to run wide it's on you to get back on the racetrack they don't have to make room for you this isn't a merge on the highway there's no zipper merge here you made your bed you have to lie in it now so that was a bad start of the day right there. And then you have Byron going out there and doing what he does. And you have Christopher Bell deciding at the end of stage one that he's going to go take the stage win, take the points, right? He already has a race win this year. So why not just collect as many points as you can uh, for the playoffs? And then they thought their strategy could potentially work out for them. And honestly, it did work out for them because they ended up finishing second. But we had varying strategies, which is something that we always want to see when we get to road courses. And we'd probably see more of it if we got rid of stage breaks, but we're not here to talk about stage breaks because they're not going to listen to us. They did, and then they said, look, we were right. They weren't. We're done. We're not talking about it. Sorry, mini rant right there. So then you have Chris Rebell does rebound for a second place finish. Ty Gibbs ends up finishing third. Alex Bowman comes home fourth, and the haters are absolutely furious about this. Anytime you talk about a young Chevy driver, a driver that might be in the Chevy camp, everybody on the internet's immediately like, oh, he'll be taking the 48 car from Alex Bowman soon. Well, he has three top fives in the first six races of the season. So that's not exactly anything to be ashamed of right there. And they're not happy about it because the general consensus amongst the mouth breathers out there is that Alex Bowman can't drive, even though he's a seven-time Cup Series winner. He's going to be fine in that car. He's running better than Chase Elliott right now, who... Uh, did get a penalty for cutting the course, which we're not talking about track limits because it actually didn't play a huge factor on Sunday. Still needs to be changed. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, watch the previous video that I posted, which I know there's going to be. I haven't even read the comments. I'm just not going to. And then you had a couple other things happen throughout the day. Ricky Stenhouse Jr., who apparently is just out here going all Team America on anybody that's not <laughs> born in this country if they enter a Cup Series race. Last year at the Indianapolis Road Course, he is still upset about the Revolutionary War and 1776, which he has famously called out after a win. And he just blasted Jensen Button at the Indianapolis Road Course. He's like, take this. This is for America. Get your red coat ass out of here. And he plowed through him. He also ran through Kamui Kobayashi last year because, again, I guess Pearl Harbor is still fresh in his mind and he's not happy about it. And the same thing happened again today at Circuit of the Americas. As soon as he got to Kamui Kobayashi, he just ran through him. And at this point, I think if you were born in a country that has been at war with the United States, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. thinks it's his obligation as an American to make sure he wrecks you at some point in this race. Because it just seems to be the common denominator at this point. I don't know why he could ever be upset with Kamui. I don't know why he could be upset with Jensen. He's only ever raced with them a grand total of like five times total. Makes no sense. But Ricky went out there and did it for America, I guess. I'm still a little bit baffled on that one. And then you had uh, a couple other. You had Michael McDowell out there racing without power steering, just absolutely manhandling that car around. And finally, mercifully, they put him out of his misery right at the end of that race so that he could, I don't know, keep his arms potentially for the race at Richmond on Easter Sunday. He can't be happy about racing on Easter either. But they finally did park him on lap 51. So, um, or he ran 51 laps, rather. So, poor guy. Poor guy. He was absolutely feeling it. I will say this. One thing about this race. 
Chase Briscoe managed to finish 13th. The SHR cars outside of that, they looked abysmal all day. They had no business being out there. Uh, they're not road course racers. They're short track guys, not road course guys. And that became very evident on Sunday. Overall, though, like I said, it was a bit of everything. You had um, Kyle Busch post-race going down and confronting Christopher Bell. And Kyle Busch, we've seen him mature right before our eyes. This man, to quote Pineapple Express, used to not give an F about discretion. Seven years ago at Las Vegas, he walked down the pit lane, punched Logano square in the face. Just walked up to him, bam, punched him in the face. Now, he has a son. He understands he can't go do that because if he does go punch Christopher Bell in the face, then he's going to show that to Brexton. Brexton's going to be like, I can do that. He goes and does it at Millbridge. Casey Boat talks about it for 45 minutes on DBC. We don't want that. Nobody needs that in their life. So instead, he walked down and he got in Christopher Bell's face and he scared him straight. I mean, this clip is just going to be rerun on MSNBC on Sundays at like two o'clock in the afternoon when they rerun all of the scared straights because Christopher Bell looked absolutely terrified right there. He was petrified. That's the face of a man that just wants to curl up right into a ball in the fetal position and shake until his wife comes and nurses him back to health because he was petrified. He wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. He thought he was catching a Kyle Busch uh, fist to the face. And thankfully for him, he didn't because Kyle Busch is a father of two now. So he can't be walking around punching people in the face anymore. We saw Kevin Harvick mature. Once he had a kid, he stopped hopping over race cars and tried to punch Greg Biffle in the face. Now, Kyle Busch, he's doing the same thing. He's like, I'll walk down. I'll talk to him. I'll scare him. I'll just talk to him, though. And Christopher Bell, I can guarantee you, the 20 car will not run into the 8 car at any other point this season. Overall, though, Christopher Bell kind of had it coming. I mean... He ran through the five car of Kyle Larson. That's got to be at least the fifth time that he's wrecked Larson. So Larson owes him a few times there. He ran through the eight car. I mean, I know the guy's got to come back through the field, but it's very chase risk of him to be like, I don't race this way. And then absolutely continues to race that way. So either way, the race was fine. You have Will I Am Byron out there doing nothing that's really that memorable. I mean, if you're a Byron fan, it's super memorable. But like, William's not the most entertaining person in the world. Giancarlo Esposito stayed for the entire race. He gave the command, and then he was also there for William Byron's burnout on pit, on pit lane right there uh, when he put the nose up against the wall for pit road. Gus Freen loves NASCAR, and we love him for loving that, which I honestly thought was just pretty cool that he stayed the entire race. Overall, NASCAR going to Coda is fine. We at least didn't have the same nonsense that we had during the Xfinity race with all of the penalties being called for track limits. I still think that there's work that can and should be done on NASCAR side for that, for when they go back next year, assuming they go back um, next year. Of course, this date takes one of the Texas oval dates. Uh, so does NASCAR belong at Circuit of the, Ameri Circuit of the Americas? I can honestly go either way. It is probably the most premier road course that we have in this country in terms of amenities and accommodations for the teams um, and everything like that. But at the end of the day, if they took this race off the calendar, is anybody like desperately going to miss it? Probably not. There's, I mean, there's a decent crowd there today. It wasn't a Formula One crowd. And I know people will point that out, but it's for obvious reasons. Formula One races in this country three times, supply and demand. NASCAR races in this country 38 times a year. So if you're going to plan on going to a race, you'll probably go to one closer to you. I would fly to Austin for an F1 race. I probably wouldn't fly to Austin for a NASCAR race because there's a handful of other tracks I would much rather go to than that one if we're just talking about like a, within a two to three hour flight. So yeah, I, you can kind of go either way with it. For me though, I thought this race was fine. I thought the racing was actually pretty good. I thought passing was better than it had been maybe in years past. These cars are still too, too good is really what it comes down to. They race too well on road courses, and that's why you don't see as good of a show as we once did. It's a, bu a bit of a bummer, but that's the direction NASCAR wanted to go in. If they had a narrower tire and maybe a little more horsepower, it probably would actually be a really good show out there. But when you kind of just watch the leaders drive away by like the top three between Bell, Byron, and Gibbs, we're so much better than everybody else today that they had checked out and, and kind of set sail. So it is what it is, I guess. I'm fine if they go back to Circuit of the Americas. I'm fine if they don't. I'm pretty sure that they will for 2025. And overall, this race was 
fine. It was sufficient. You had the broadcast doing kind of broadcast things, uh, but at least the racing was pretty solid throughout the day. So let me know in the comments, what rating would you give this? Did you enjoy the race? Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at BreakHard, Instagram and Twitter at BreakHardBlog.